Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to open your word. We realize the sanctuary is the law and the gospel. It is your heart of love toward us. And help us to understand the greater and deep truths that are taught here so that we can see the reality in what you are doing for us in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary. Bless each one that will connect. We commit this meeting into your hands now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus in the sanctuary, the law and the gospel, part two. Well, our key text as we go through the series, Exodus 25, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The sanctuary is God's method, God's way in reaching his children, Israel. And of course, as we study this, in reaching us, uh, he found a way to bridge the gap. Exodus 25, verse 40, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So we've discovered in our studies thus far, the sanctuary was a pattern of the true and real sanctuary in heaven. And it was a shadow of things to come. Psalm 77 verse 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? And this is a schematic di diagram as you see. The sinner would come in facing west. And as he came to the door, the entrance, the courtyard, he was now confronted with a gate, a curtain. Jesus says very clearly in John chapter 10 and verses 7, I am the door of the sheep. And in verses 9, he says, I am the door. And if anyone enter in, he shall be saved and shall find past and come in and out. And so Jesus tells us he is the way. And so as the sinner came in, we've been studying the altar of burnt offering. Well, as the sinner came there with an offering, we're going to look at the offerings this evening and what they meant. And as we look at the offerings this evening, we see that there are five different types. But you needed a sanctuary. You needed a priest. The priest was the mediator. You needed a sacrifice. And then, of course, the law. Because from the opposite end, as the sinner came in with his offering, his sacrifice, there, right at the end of the sanctuary, in the Holy of Holies, was the Ark of the Covenant, where God's law and the mercy seat over God's law, showing, showing God's love for his children, though we have sinned and broken his law, which is the definition of sin, by the way, in 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Yet God found a way in love and mercy to have sin transferred from the sinner to the sacrifice. The sacrifice now was guilty of sins transferred. And so it died as a result of the penalty of the law. Sin is the wages. Uh, the wages of sin is death. And so, but God would find Grace and mercy for his people and dwelling between the cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant between the two angels that looked down in holy reverence on the law. God would receive the priests who would bring the record of sin through the blood now. The blood was defiled because of sin and it was only taken off by faith and deposited in the sanctuary. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the blood or the record of sin through the blood was cleansed through the Lord's goat. And every sin offering that was brought, the sinner had to confess over its head. And so there was a transfer of sin onto this substitute, this animal that had to be perfect and holy and spotless. And through its blood now defiled by sin, the priest would carry it into the sanctuary. First of all, place it on the horns of the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard, and then on the horns of the sanctuary, of the inside the holy place where you had the altar of incense, and there the record of sin was placed there. Of course, once a year, the sin was removed. But there's a diagram showing you the, di the dimensions of the sanctuary. The outer courtyard was 45 meters long, 0.7, and its width was about 22 meters. And inside the sanctuary itself, the tabernacle was only 13.7 meters long, 
and it was 4.5 meters wide. Of course, the dimension, the temple later on that Solomon built were huge. And everything was built on a much grander scale. But this one was small because it had to be carried. And so it was to be set up and dismantled wherever the children of Israel moved until they got to the promised land. So we see, again, the temple was always facing west. God did it specifically because he knew where Israel had been in Egypt. The idolaters that worshipped Amun-Ra worshipped in the east facing the sun. And so did all the Canaanites, whether they were worshipping Baal or whether they were worshipping Ashtara or Ashtoreth. Everything was facing east. And so here we have a few things that uh, we need to remember. We're coming in next year. We're going to be looking at the holy place and the most holy place. We're only going to cover the bronze altar uh, this evening from last week. And then, of course, we begin with the labor, which was also made of bronze. And we looked at the fact that Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins is portrayed in the sanctuary. Beginning in the courtyard, the altar of burnt offerings where the sacrifices were made. And of course, as you look at it and we move forward, you've got the laver, which would be where Jesus covers us through his grace and mercy. And of course, the, the laver is covering the loins or the passions. Everything needs to be sanctified through Christ. And then in the holy place, the table of showbread. It also had articles on it there of incense. It also had some vessels that wine would be put into. It also had on the other side the table of candle, the, the seven branch candlestick. And then in the center was the altar of incense, which we will study all in particular next year. And then the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant with God's law. We've looked at it before. Now, you needed to have the priest and the priest and specifically the high priest would officiate as mediators. Only through the priest could God meet with the people. And it was a very important lesson because Christ would become our high priest. And of course, the earthly priest, as they officiated in the daily, where the record of sin was deposited in the sanctuary, the high priest alone would officiate at the end of the, towards the end of the, the festivals, the seven festivals or the Jewish calendar, the day of atonement was when the sanctuary was cleansed and only the high priest would officiate and go once a year into the most holy place and sprinkle blood uh, to cleanse the record of sin. So sin came in the sanctuary through blood. Of course, the blood, the sin was defiled. The blood was defiled, sorry, through the sins transferred. It's showing a transfer of sin. But on the Day of Atonement, the Lord's goat, no hands were laid over the head. No sins were confessed over it because its blood was pure and spotless, pointing to Christ's pure and spotless blood that was to atone, to cleanse the sins that had been gathered in the sanctuary during the daily services. And so, of course, the lamb, the sacrifice was also a type and a shadow of Christ because Christ took our sins upon him. And so because of that, he died on the cross. So it foreshadowed Christ's death. But the record of sin was now transferred and only through the Day of Atonement could the record of sin be cleansed. And so the priests in the beautiful white garments representing the spotless nature of Christ who would be our priest, but more specifically our high priest. The high priest had beautiful ornamental garments. We will look at that in the new year, what all those colors represented. He had an ephod there with 12 beautiful precious stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He had the Urim and the Thummim on one end of the shoulder. And, and we will study all that. But as he went into the holy place, we looked at three articles of furniture. 
on one side as you entered, of course, was the table of showbread, and the opposite side was the table, not the table, but the candle, seven branch candlestick, and then, of course, the altar of incense. Now, the altar of incense was just before the veil. Behind the veil, of course, was the holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. This altar was connected with the altar of um, burnt offering outside because the blood from the altar of sacrifice was also put on the four horns. You can see the four horns of the altar of incense. And then, of course, the record of sin was transferred there. The priest would burn incense. We will find out what all that represents. But as the smoke of the incense ascended, it would fill the whole sanctuary, including the most holy place, because the curtain didn't go right up to the roof. There was a gap where the incense would flow into uh, the altar of, from the altar of incense onto and into the holy place, the most holy place, where, of course, the Ark of the Covenant was. And so it was connected with that service. It says here in Hebrews 9 verse 3, And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. And so the holiest of all was where, like I say, the cleansing of the sanctuary took place once a year. And the, the high priest would dip his hand in uh, the offering, the Lord's goat, and seven times the blood was deposited on top of the mercy seat. And between the cherubim was the holy Shekinah that represented the presence of God. And so the highlight of the sanctuary service was the Day of Atonement because that's when all the sins that had been deposited there through the record of the defiled blood was atoned for. Notice what it says here in Exodus 25 verse 21. What was in the most holy place between the Ark of the Covenant and the Cherubim. It says, you shall put on the mercy seat on top of the Ark. And in the Ark, you shall put the testament. That's the Ten Commandments that I will give you. And there, God said to Moses, I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim, which are on the Ark of the Testament. And so this was where God's Holy Shekinah presence dwelt. By the way, the table of showbread was called, the bread was called the bread of the presence. So, yes, God met with his people in the holy place, but once a year in the most holy place, when the high priest came in with an offering for sin that had accumulated during the daily services, and of course with all the different offerings that were brought by the worshippers, here God would meet with the high priest between the Ark of the Testimony. It was called the Shekinah Presence. And so the high priest, of course, represented the work of Jesus Christ, our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Again, we will look at it next year. And so we can see how this was foreshadowed and symbolized through the earthly priest of what Jesus, our true high priest, would do with his perfect sacrifice and his blood that we offered once for all the high priest had to offer every year first of all an offering for him and for the priest and then for the people during the daily services the priests would have to offer for the morning and evening sacrifices for the congregation of israel and then of course for all the individual sacrifices for the sin offerings that came in with the worshippers. And so here's something very important to remember. That the priest was a mediator. And through the priest, the worshippers, the congregation, those who brought their sin offerings found access to God. And of course, it was all in type and symbol how we would find access to God through Jesus Christ. Notice here it says in Revelation 11 verse 19. And the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And of course, in that ark of the testament in heaven is the true copy of the Ten Commandments. And of course, this is the work that Jesus is doing for us after he ascended into heaven, after he had sacrificed for us on the cross of Calvary. And so remember, when God had created Adam and Eve, 
they were to be eternally kept by God's power and by God's love if they were obedient to him and they did not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, it was through obedience to God's law, his perfect law, that he would have explained to them the Garden of Eden before sin. As they were obedient to God, they were in a saving and faithful relationship with Jesus. And so they were safe in him. God would keep them through his power. And as soon as they had disobeyed God, well, they brought sin and with sin came death and separation from God. So God had to find a way to save them because this is what God had said to them. For in the day that you eat of it, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Well, we know because Eve wandered away from her husband, Adam, and listened to the temptations of the serpent who questioned God's love, questioned God's grace, questioned God's loyalty to them and said, is it true that God has said that you shall not eat of every tree out of the garden? And of course, God had said that they were free to eat of every tree except that one. But the way how he framed the question is, is it true? Has God, God has withheld something from you. And he even said to them, listen, if you eat of this fruit here, you will be like God. That's why God has not wanted you to eat. In other words, God was lying to them and God was withholding from them. And he further on probably could have taken a bite of whatever that fruit was and said, look, man, look, this has made me wise. And so as Eve considers all this here, she takes that fruit and eats of it. And so she immediately is guilty. She feels the misery and woe of sin. She takes it to her husband and he eats of it. And so they have now broken God's holy law. They have sinned against God. And God has got to find a way to save them. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. So that day they would have died for sure had God not provided a way of escape. Wow. God gives them in type and symbol the gift of Jesus Christ who would come, the seed of the woman, the Messiah. For the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So Genesis 3, 15, we looked at this text before, but again, God says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. In other words, God says, if you will accept the gift of the seed of the woman, which was the Messiah through which the offerings and the sacrifices were types and shadows and symbols, well, I'm going to put enmity between you and the devil. I'll be between, in it between you and the woman. Devil, first of all, between your seed and her seed, there would be a separation between those who are the worshippers, the true worshippers of God, and those who are the followers of the devil, Satan, Lucifer. And so it goes and say, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here's something very important to remember. When the Messiah would come, when the seed of the woman would come, Satan would be bruised. That word bruised is crushed in the Hebrew. Satan's head was crushed. But you know, when you crush a serpent, it doesn't die immediately. Satan knew that his kingdom was lost. And that's why he tried to get Jesus not to die on the cross. And you devil, you will bruise his heel. Well, Jesus did die, but he rose again on the third day. And so when you uh, crush someone on the heel, well, it's temporal. You crush someone on the head, well, they're going to die. God set up in the Garden of Eden the sacrificial systems. And so those animals now would be substitutionary. They would be in types and shadows and symbols of what the true Lamb of God would do. And here is something very important. The skins of the, those animals that had lost their lives as a result of taking on the guilt of the sinner, their skins and coats were clothed or to clothe Adam and Eve. In other words, God would cover them completely with his righteousness and he would pay the price for their sins. And so Revelation 13 verse 8 aptly says, the lamb, speaking of Jesus, slain from the foundation of the world. And so from Genesis to Revelation, we see it was only through the blood, precious blood as of the clear, precious blood. God, blood of Jesus Christ without blemish and spot. Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness. So why blood? Because only a God who is as holy as his law could atone 
for the broken law of God. So had God through his son Jesus not stepped in that very day when Adam and Eve had sinned and promised to be a surety for them, of which the sacrifices were types and shadows and symbols, they would have had no hope. They would have had to die immediately that day. And so every sacrifice from that point forward, from the time of sin, pointed to the coming of Christ. And these were mostly burnt offerings. We're going to look at the different types of offerings. And, and here are they. Five types of offerings, sin offerings. The first one was the burnt offerings, of which most of them uh, were brought before God. And many times a burnt offering accompanied a meal offering and a peace offering. And so burnt offerings were the ones which would have been foreshadowed during the time in the Garden of Eden, during the time of Noah, during the time of the patriarchs, during the time of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob, right up until we, the time we get to Moses. So we're going to look at these. What was a burnt offering? The burnt offering was voluntary. It was in contrast to all the others that were mandatory. It signified consecration and dedication. So this was something that when the sinner realized that I need to be right with God, and I want to be made whole, he would bring a burnt offering. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3. We can't do, go through every text, but if you read Leviticus 1, right up to chapter 6, it covers all the different types of offerings. So here's the burnt offering. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice, so the same thing, burnt offering, burnt sacrifice, of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Right, it couldn't have sores, it couldn't have any eczema, it couldn't have, it couldn't be lame, it couldn't have any kind of sickness because it represented a substitutionary sacrifice, just as Jesus became our substitution. He, the sinner, shall offer it of his own free will. So you see, it was a voluntary offering at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. So as they came in the courtyard, it would be offered at the offering uh, of sacrifice or the offering of burnt offerings, uh, the altar of burnt offerings. Leviticus 4, 1 verse 4. Then he, this is the sinner, the offerer, shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, obviously before it was slain. Here is clearly taught transfer of sin. So the sinner brings an offering he puts his hand on the head of this animal, whether it is a goat or whether it was sheep or whatever it was. The hands is symbolic of consecration. Now, in the New Testament, we taught about the laying on of hands, right? Uh, so it was also in the Old Testament when a king was to be anointed the priest would lay hands on him as well. So it was a transfer of God's blessing upon the king or when a priest was to be anointed. A high priest was to be anointed. When Aaron was anointed by Moses, uh, Moses had to lay his hands upon his head and then pour oil upon him, uh, signifying uh, a special ceremony. So in likewise, when the sinner brought an offering, he laid his hands signifying his guilt that was being transferred to this animal. And now it was guilty of sins thus transferred. And so the same person now, the priest would hand him a knife. And now because this animal, it would now receive the penalty of death. Notice what it says here. And it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement, cleansing for sin. That word atonement means cleansing for sin, at one moment. Notice what it says here in Romans 12 verse 1. Similarly, a burnt offering signified what we are to do when we consecrate our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul writes this here in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies to be a what? A living sacrifice. That's the burnt offering. 
the burnt sacrifice. Um, and it was to be given voluntarily by the sinner to God. And it was to be a holy act, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So the burnt offering signified consecration and dedication to God's service. And this is what all these offerings foreshadowed here. And of course, Jesus was consecrated for us as our sin offering. Jesus took upon himself our sins and he was slain that we might have life. And so clearly we can see here a transfer of sins. And of course, the burnt offerings that were offered in the Old Testament and the sanctuary service all foreshadowed what Jesus would do for us in reality. And so it says here in Hebrews 9 verse 11, it's a beautiful truth, friends. But Christ became as high priest of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is not of this creation. What would Jesus do for us? Not with the blood of goats and calves. Those were offered in the daily and once a year, of course, it was the goats in the yearly day of atonement. They were types and symbols. But Jesus would only offer himself once. It says here, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once for all. Isn't that beautiful? Having obtained eternal redemption. And so you can see very clearly that all these symbols of the burnt offerings and the trespass offerings and the meal offerings, all these were symbolic of what Jesus would do for us. Here's Hebrews 10 verse 10 as well. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Isn't this so wonderfully taught in the book of Hebrews? Well, what lessons can we learn from this? First of all, all must be put on the altar. Nothing must be held back. God wants order in his work because, you know, the burnt offering had to be cut up. Um, only what was cut and placed in order was put on and offered as a burnt sacrifice. The entrails and many of that was thrown away. And everything else was burned on the altar of sacrifice. Notice what it says here, Leviticus 1 verse 7. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. And so God is a God of order. Then the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts so they were to be washed, signifying that God is its a work of cleansing. That's where the labor came in. Uh, these parts were washed and then put on order. The head and the fat in order. Now the fat was separated because fat is a symbol of sin. And it was to be consumed, burnt on the altar of sacrifice. Uh, it says here, and the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. Of course, Jesus died on a wooden cross. And so it clearly symbolized the cross. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice. And so... The burnt sacrifice many times offered other sacrifices. And so the three elements of purification used in the burnt sacrifice was fire, water, and blood, right? They had to be fire to consume the sacrifice. And so the sins would be consumed. The water was used to wash and cleanse. And of course, the blood was used to place on the horns of the altar of sacrifice in the court, and then the altar of incense in the holy place. Notice what it says here. Isaiah 4 verse 4, speaking about the water, right? When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. So the water is a symbol of cleansing. It says here, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Just as there was a holy Shekinah, between the Ark of the Covenant, between the cherubim, the angels looking down upon the law. So God is symbolized by fire. Notice what it says in Hebrews 12 verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. He will either consume sin if we will uh, confess our sins to him and present our bodies to him to be a living sacrifice. If we hold on to our sin, well, we will be consumed. So it's either we're going to be saved by God or we're going to be consumed by God. 
So God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 9 verse 22, the blood. Well, the water is there. The wood is there. The fire is there. What about the blood? Why blood? And it's important to know what blood. It was the blood of Jesus Christ alone that can cleanse us from sin because it was the perfect offering. An angel couldn't die for the sins of the world. Even the Adam couldn't die for Eve before he sinned, of course. It could only be God himself. God would make a way. God would make a way for sin. It says here, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. And importantly, what was it? For the blood, for it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. In other words, in other words, those sacrifices were symbols. It was only the life of Jesus Christ, the true lamb, that could make atonement for sin. Well, what about the fire? I want you to know that fire was not common fire. Later on, Nadam um, and Obayu, the sons of Aaron, offered common fire on the altar. And God struck them dead because... The fire that was there was a holy fire that God started when Moses consecrated the sanctuary, its first service. Fire came down from heaven. And that was the fire that was holy. It was the only one that was to be used in the service of dealing with sin. And God is telling us that God is a holy God. Sin is a terrible thing. It's offensive to God. Sin causes death. But God would find a way, a plan of salvation to save people from sin. So notice about this fire. It was continual. The bread in the sanctuary was continual. It always had to be on the table of showbread. The light that was in the seven branch candle, it was continual. That's that word tamid. It would never be put out, except, of course, when they were now moving. Now, notice what it says here. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you, right? And there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And so the Bible says in Leviticus 9 verse 24, and they came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering. And so that fire was to be holy forever. And so it was the fire to be used for every sacrifice. And the fact which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell upon their faces. And so God was showing through the sanctuary services the holiness of all that he had sanctified. Water is also symbolic of baptism and the word both of cleansing. It says here, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And notice what it says here, that he might sanctify it, that's the church with the washing of water by the, by the word. And so water is a cleansing uh, agent. And it also symbolizes the work of the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah uh, 44 verses 3, God says, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, speaking of the Spirit of God. And so notice here in Acts 22 verse 16, this was Ananias that speaks to Paul after he had accepted Jesus Christ. Why are you waiting? He's talking to Paul. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And so the labor, we will study that in the new year. The labor was symbolic of the washing away of sin and dedication in baptism. And so the second offering was the meal or meat, the meat or meal offering. Now, they were also not just meat offerings as in flesh, but also they were meal offerings. Uh, it could be flour. Uh, it was oil sometimes. Uh, the meal offering symbolized total submission and dependence upon God's sovereignty and also their willingness to be stewards of their bodies and all that God would entrust them. They were an act of homage to God. So while as the burnt offering was consecration and dedication to God, the meal offering was an act of homage, of thankfulness. It was also a thanks offering. Notice what it says here in Leviticus 2 verse 1. When anyone offers a grain offering, so there were grain offerings uh, to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. And so the flour, which symbolized, of course, the body of Christ, uh, the table of showbread had the, the bread that symbolized his body, 
Of course, it was through the seed of the, the wheat crushed that it made flour. Christ was crushed for us. His body was bruised and broken on the cross that we might have life. And so you can see the powerful symbolism it was. He shall bring it to, the, to Aaron's sons, the priests, one of whom shall take from it his handful of fine flour and oil worth frankincense. And the priest shall burn it as a memorial on the altar. That's the altar of burnt offering again in the courtyard made by fire, a sweet aroma to God. And so in, in a certain sense, it still, although it didn't shed blood, the book of Hebrews says, and almost all things are purged without uh, by blood. Well, this was the one offering only that showed the crushing of the body of God and it could be a grain offering. And so here is the lessons here. What did these meal offerings teach? The burnt offering said, I, all that I am is the Lord's consecration, right? The meal offering said, all that I have is the Lord's. And so one was willing to use their means for the, the, the blessing of God and leading people to know about God and his love. Well, Leviticus 22 says in verse 21, and whoever offers a sacrifice of peace offering, now we come to the third category of offerings, was called a peace offering unto the Lord uh, to, fulfill, to fulfill his vow. Or a free will offering from the cattle or of the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. And so here we come to the third category of offering. Sin offering it was called a peace offering. Peace offerings were for any occasion of thankfulness and joy. You know, we just had a beautiful service in Pine Town. It was called Thanksgiving. People just brought something to show to God, I'm thankful. It could be a gift. It could be money. It could be something in kind. Well, these peace offerings were for any occasion of thankfulness and joy. Also in making a vow, if someone like the Nazarites would uh, make a vow before the Lord, uh, there are many instances in the Old Testament where people would make a vow and they would bring this offering, this peace offering, which was an act of saying, okay, it is now solidifying this vow that I'm making before the Lord. There were offerings for mercies received, thanks for blessings enjoyed. And so, these three categories, there were three categories of peace offerings. It was a thanks offering, an offering for a vow, and of course it was a voluntary offering. And so this word peace offering in Hebrew comes from the root word meaning to make up or to supply what is wanting. It was to pay or bring a recompense. It denotes a state in which misunderstandings have been cleared up and wrongs righted. And of course, brings about feelings of gratitude, of goodness, of peace. Now, Leviticus 3 verse 2 says, when his offering is, is a sacrifice of a peace offering, what would it be? He offers it of the herd, whether of male or female. He shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. Again, it had to be pure and spotless because it was pointing. It foreshadowed. It was symbolic of Jesus' pure and spotless life that was given for ours. So, right, what can we learn from this year? The peace offerings. They were communion offerings. Burnt offerings were burnt on the altar. Nothing was to be eaten. Meal offerings were to be partly burnt, partly eaten, and um, they were divided, these meal offerings, um, between these peace offerings, sorry, were divided between God, the priest, and the giver. And so some were for the priest, some were, for God, they were burnt on the altar of offering, uh, the altar of sacrifice, but the giver could take some home. Now, notice what it says here. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. And so here's something important to remember. Fat was never to be eaten, was forbidden by God because it was symbolic of sin. Now, fat is where all uh, toxins are stored in the body. And so it was symbolic of sin. So the fat was consumed on the altar. This shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. Again, blood was symbolic of sin. And so sin 
that was defiled was taken into the sanctuary. Fat was where all toxins were stored in the body. So these are symbols of sin. And so they defile. And that's why God said, do not eat of them. Right? Peace offerings, Jesus spoke of these when he said in John 14 verse 27. He is our God of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so peace offerings was one way that people would find peace with God. Well, we get to the fourth offering. It was just called a sin offering. Sin offerings were, sins for, for, were for sins of ignorance. They didn't cover sins done consciously, knowingly, defiantly, or persistently. We cover that in the fifth and the last category. These sins sufficed for sins done through ignorance. So, for example, in Leviticus 4 verse 2, if someone sinned not realizing but later on came to their knowledge, they would bring a sin offering. Uh, if the whole congregation of Israel sinned through ignorance, uh, that we find in Leviticus 4 verses 13, well, they would have to bring an offering, the congregation, the, they would bring an offering to the priest, the priest would uh, offer this for Israel. And if anyone else sinned and didn't realize it later on, different ways, mistakes or rash acts where someone did something or in a moment of rage and fit, uh, murdered someone, killed something, you could still find forgiveness. You could bring a sin offering. Now notice here in Leviticus 4 verse 3, these are type of examples. Even if a priest sinned, he had to bring a sin offering. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt upon the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. How did this uh, go? He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting that's in the courtyard before the Lord. Lay his hand on the bull's head. Again, you see transfer of sin. And kill the bull before the Lord. Notice what would happen. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil in the sanctuary. That was for the priest. But some of the ones were different. They were sins for the ruler, the king, sin offerings for the common people, sin offering to the congregation. Here's a one for the congregation, Leviticus 4 verse 13. If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden before the eyes of the assembly, but God brings it to, of course, their knowledge. If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin. So God says, you know, at the times of ignorance, I winked at it. But when we come to a knowledge of where we have transgressed God's law, then we need to bring an offering. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull, right? Again, transfer of son. Before the Lord, then the bull shall be killed before the Lord. The anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood to the tabernacle of the meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. This is also done uh, for this sin offering. Right? And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar. Remember, the, the horns symbolize what? The horns symbolize power. The horns symbolize power of forgiveness. They were to be a, a record of sin on the horns of the altar. He shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. He shall take all the fat from it and burn it on the altar. So the priest would burn everything. And so again, this altar was very, very important because this is where atonement was made for sin. And the record of sin was taken into the sanctuary. And once a year, the day of atonement, there would be, of course, the cleansing of sin in the sanctuary. Now we come to the last one. Um, it, it was called the trespass offering. Sin uh, or trespass offerings rather differ from sin offerings which are done in ignorance. Trespass offerings provided for sins done knowingly or willingly. Here's a few examples again. If a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbor, so of course that of course is found in the commandments, thou shalt not what? Bear false witnesses against the Lord and against your neighbor. Well, what if you lied to your neighbor about something delivered to him for safekeeping and you said, well, it was stolen, it's not stolen, you've stolen, or about a pledge, or about a robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbor, 
Well, then it shall be because he has sinned and is guilty that, first of all, he had to restore what he has taken or what he has stolen, and then he had to bring a trespass offering. He shall bring a, his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish from the flock, with uh, your valuation as a trespass offering to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any one of these things that he may have done in which he has trespassed. And so you can see this all came about as a result of the sanctuary service where the priest would atone. And as on the day of atonement, the high priest would atone once for all. And this is how sin was dealt with. And so we have this beautiful, beautiful sanctuary service. And I just pray that you'll continue to study and that God will bless you as you see through the types and the shadows, as you see through the symbols in the sanctuary, all the wonderful attributes of God's love, of God's grace, and how he's dealing with and putting away sin once for all in Jesus Christ. And so I hope you've been blessed as I've been blessed. And so it's time to close in prayer. And I'll ask you just to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful study where we've understood that you are a holy God and that sin cannot dwell in your presence and that we as sinners can be cleansed from our sin through the sin offerings. And we thank you that you found a way in the Old Testament by faith the worshippers could find forgiveness and sin would be transferred into sanctuary and once a year on the Day of Atonement the sins would be cleansed forever. We thank you that once Jesus died for all and that he's putting away sin in the heavenly sanctuary and that when the judgment is over and the records have been washed in the blood of Christ, those sins that have been transferred in the sanctuary, those who are unconfessed, those sins unconfessed remain on the guilty party and they are lost forever. I just pray that you will save us, that none of us may be lost, that when you come in the clouds of glory, we may be together with you and the redeemed forever. In Jesus' name, amen.